7 a.m. in the morning for me, so it's different time shit. But yeah, that's fine. So thank you for coming to the session. It's we're talking about that creating a modern web application using Symfony API platform. Well, and React as well. How many of you are using I mean, Drupal as you know as back end and doing something in the front end, you know, like JSON API or something like that? Yeah. It's been fun, it's good, it works, it's pretty well. Uh, this is a little different approach. It's still using that kind of model, you know, having a back end for having the data and then using something different on the front end, you know, like modern JavaScript framework React in this particular case. And well, let's start. Uh, so I am Jesus Manuel Olivas. You can find me as JM or LBAS pretty much, you know, all the social network places, you know, like Twitter and GitHub and, you know, Drupal.org. It's my little blog, and well, I am from a little tiny town. It's called. It's a nice story about the name. So Mexicali, which is like where the town with Calexico is in the U.S. So names are like you know, Mexicali is from you know Mexi and California, and then Calexico is Cali and Mexico. It's like twin cities. From a Mexican, I'm from the Mexican side and U.S. side. I mean, Mexico, Mexicali is like little tiny town, but then Calexico is like mm, mm, way way more little. But it's I mean two hours from San Diego drive, so it's not. Are far. <laughs> and well, I mean, talk about the company. I mean, we are, the company name is, is we know. We do, we're mostly like, uh, we do a lot of Drupal. We started as Drupal company for a long time, like eight years. And I mean, two years ago, I uh, joined the, uh, the company as a partner and we decided to move forward. So it's like, we're doing, still doing a lot of Drupal, most forward Drupal, we're doing a lot of React and Symfony and using other platforms as well. And we are a fully remote company. We are in all these countries. Actually, we're missing, I mean, some people from from uh, Argentina. So this map should be updated one of those days. And yeah, I mean, we still have one of ours, one of my business partners is living in Australia. This little, I mean, the very south of the south is in Tasmania. And yeah, we have some people in, in France as well. But yeah, fully remote. I think like we're like 12 countries now. We are 40 something, 44, 40 something. And again, I was, as I was mentioned, we start mostly doing Drupal, but that's, I mean, somehow we start adding more and more like related technologies, and we do all this stuff now. You know, mostly Drupal, we a lot of DevOps, a lot of like front end now, which is it's been really really fun. And that's, I mean, little, I mean, what we were, I mean, all we're talking about. Yeah. And also, we we contribute. Oh, sorry, I didn't get this thing. Sorry. And and we contribute a lot. So I mean, one of the projects we maintain. The three main maintainers of the project are within the company. We use, I mean, I don't know, how many of you are used Drupal console before? It's, you know, save some time for mine while working? It's, well, I mean, and that's an all, I don't know, I have no idea how many downloads we have. This is for, you know, probably a couple of months all, yeah. And well, must, again, going back to the early beginning of the session, this, I mean, what I was talking, we must, we should start as a Drupal, and probably all of you, most of you start doing Drupal, and then once you start using Drupal for, different things, which we tend to abuse Drupal, you know, use for every single need. There's a client with a need, and always let's use Drupal because Drupal is, is incredible, this is, is awesome, and allowed you to do like, way too many things. And it's good somehow, but sometimes it's, it's not that good anymore, because you end up, again, abusing using Drupal for every single client need. And sometimes you need something different, and we'll see. And again, when all you have is a, uh, is a hammer, I mean, everything looks like a nail, right? So it looks like this, no Drupal for every single thing. And well, and going back to history, I mean, when, since we're using Drupal, you know, because the CMS allow you to do content entry, all this editorial experience, but what if you don't need that? What if you don't need all that thing? What if you only need using or exposing an endpoint for, you know, and then use a front end tool for pulling that data? So let's see what else we have in the world I mean, that is not Drupal anymore. Because again, when CMS is in the model, like CMS, CMS means get born like you know, 17, 18 years ago, and it's the same tool allows you to enter data and expose and publish that data. Now, and nowadays, things are changing, you know, like JSON API, GraphQL, so you can use still using, again, Drupal for, for the backend thing or for storing the data, and, and I mean, probably use those tools as a headless CMS, and that's, that's pretty cool. This is something like this. Now we have like Drupal, we have JSON API, which is pretty cool. We even have some distributions in the Drupal world that out of the box, I mean, expose all your data or your content or your content types as an API. 
There is also our, a, um, this GraphQL now thing and Drupal is a module that can expose GraphQL endpoint, which is pretty cool. And then you can use you know, a different tool like React or Vue for, for pulling the data and showing that, and again, using a modern JavaScript framework, making your front end people happy. And I mean, as a company owner, I can tell you it's way easier to hire someone who knows React and Vue pretty well versus hiring so someone who knows Drupal theming pretty well. Because Drupal theming is a little complicated, you know, render array and pre-processing and all that. So it's, I mean, there's some other challenges. I mean, obviously when you're working with these technologies, but I mean, again, it's, it's easier. But I mean, we're still using Drupal here, but what if, what if, you don't need something like, you know, like graphical interface to manage in your, your queries, you know, like views. I mean, what if you don't need a, um, a graphical interface to create in your, you know, your models, you know, like, I mean, because Drupal, it's great because you can use the graphical interface to create in your like, content types, adding fields and all that. But there's, I mean, what if you don't need that? I mean, maybe you don't, your client, I mean, or you don't require some like f site builder for doing that. Maybe you just need to build something, you know, create all those entities or tables and, and that ain't gonna change in a while. So I mean, maybe, maybe you don't need Drupal at that point. Maybe you don't need widgets and formatters. I mean, since you are not taking advantage of Drupal for rendering the thing, it's only it's like storing the data. You don't, you, maybe you don't require a, con, I mean, a complex content model, you know, like paragraphs and all that. All the editorial workflow, because this is, I mean, if you're requiring editorial workflow, then Drupal is your thing. I mean, you keep, keep, keep using Drupal. But if you don't need that, you know, the content, reviewing all that, you don't need to like, I mean, scheduling content for publishing, you know, next day or next week, I mean, maybe, I mean, if you don't need that, you don't need revisions, maybe there's some other choice like this, not Drupal. And I mean, since we all know PHP pretty well, we can probably use Symfony. And we're already using Symfony, I mean, on the back end, right? Because Drupal, I mean, it, it, it's Drupal 8, latest version, it's using a lot of Symfony components. So there's a project in Symfony that is called API Platform. You know, Drupal, I mean, Symfony has this uh, projects, it's kind of like Drupal distribution. So there's an API platform and this is, this project is really, really cool. I'll show you I mean, how this looks like. But it's, uh, it's think about this as, as a JSON API distribution for, but, uh, but for Symfony, you know? Allow you to expose your, your, I mean, your data with endpoints, with a JSON, I mean, JSON endpoint or even GraphQL. And, and that's the things we're gonna start, I mean, tell you, you know. And then it's, again, it's built on Symfony Sorry, the project is called API Platform, and again, allows you to export your data as a JSON, endpoints, or even GraphQL. And then we'll be using uh, some React.js for rendering data. And this is kind of the recipe we follow whenever we're building a web application that is not content-centric. And first thing, this project is based on the very latest release of Symfony, and also take advantage of Symfony Flex. So again, Symfony is more, seems like more focused for developers, a little more complicated for setting up. It's not like Drupal. I mean, before Symfony Flex, you know, it's like whenever you add a bundle, which is kind of like a module in Drupal, you're required to manually go to some place and register and do that, all these like little things, changing the files, you know, editing files, and through, I mean, through an editor or Beam if you want to. But I mean, it's not like and like Drupal. You know, you have a module, you download, and you just run a command and get a, and get a install. But with Symfony Flex, they are fixing some of those issues. You know, while using Symfony Flex, allow you to, whenever you require a package or a dependency, it gets automatically configured in your system, in your application, which is which is beautiful. And Symfony Flex is only a Composer plugin. So whenever you run Composer require, you know, a particular package that gets downloaded in your system, and any any configuration that it's uh, set. Or, or as a recipe on that package or bundle gets copied into your project and you, I mean, you have all that configuration automatically in the system. So again, you don't have to worry about going, I mean, manually editing those files. And well, and same thing for removing component. You remove a component, takes care of removing all that configuration from your system. And how to do, how this, how, I mean, Flex do that? Because there is a config directory, pretty similar what we are with, using with Drupal. And then you have this, I mean, this, files, these YAML files, who contains all this configuration. So let's say config, let's say something like packages, and within packages we have the different, you know, like JWT for like authentications. Every, any configuration file on that bundle or package gets automatically copied here and automatically register in the system, so you don't have to worry about it. It's automatically for you. It's kind of more like Drupal approach of doing things. And that's, that's great of, I mean, 
I think it was a great movement from, from Symfony because making things easier for people working with the framework. But yes, let's go to the main topic of this. What's the API platform? I mean, it's a framework. It is, uh, it's defined as, you know, as a REST or in GraphQL framework to build a modern API-driven project. And this project contains four projects within the, within the, pro within the, the, the framework itself. And a uh, good thing about this is allows you to keep using your knowledge of, of Drupal, you know, all this, like, I mean, I'm sorry, of, of uh, Symfony and PHP that you already had because you're working with, with Drupal 8. And again, it's, it's just taking advantage of Symfony Flex. I mean, there's some difference here and there, like database, I mean, access, it's, it's controlled by Doctrine, which is the ORM used in this and by Symfony. It's a little different than, you know, what we are used to with Query Entity Builder or Query Builder and Drupal, but somehow it relates, to, it allows you to write scripts for pulling data, or I mean, creating data, I mean, or, or pulling or pushing data down to your database. And well, again, you can reuse all of your knowledge that you already have with Drupal 8 and with Symfony, like controllers and routes, all that, it's just exactly the same between each other. And again, the project has like four pieces. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the API part for now. And the other pieces are a schema part, which is basically allows you to get any schema.org compliant project and get automatically built in your project. I mean, get built in your project for you. You just get that, and you just register on your, on your project and your entities, and you just you can easily create entities from there. And that project allows you to provide you with several like a schema definitions, like users or books or things like that that already I mean predefined for you. And it also provides a React application front end for admin, you know, it's an admin tool for editing content and all the kind of like little CMS thing. It's not that great, but it works. We don't use that. We kind of build other, I mean, a different React application. Nice thing about this admin, I mean, tool it is it takes advantage of React admin project and basically just pull data from the API metadata and build all the forms for you. Like you have to do nothing. It's basically one JavaScript file and takes care of building all these forms and, ed and editing forms and allow you to add data and edit, de and edit and update, insert, delete, all that thing. So, I mean, if you need something real quick, like quick and dirty and you sort of start anything, entering data on an API, that, that will work. I mean, and it's pretty customizable. You can change forms, you know, make sure, sure this field is a select drop down that gets data from here and there. So it's, I mean, you can do a lot of things here. Uh, but somehow it's limited, so we end up always grinding or using or building this React application on top of that. And also has this CLI for creating a React app if you want to. Let's kind of create create React app and allow you to create, you know, all let's pass this entity name. It takes care of okay, all these forms for you. I mean, you don't want to use the, the auto I mean, generated admin. I mean, you can just I mean, run few commands and create all those I mean, all that code for you. And how to get this project? I don't know if you're aware of Drupal, I mean, I don't know if you recall like a few months ago, there was a blog post talking about how complicated it was to get Drupal in your system, you know, like, like, you know, like 30, I mean, like 20 clicks and, you know, like it took you like 15 minutes and things like that. And then a, uh, there was an initiative and, you know, the community works and getting like this easier. There's one command you run now, get download Drupal and all that for you. And but, I mean, this is something pretty standard for the rest of the projects. Maybe Drupal was a little, over complicated before, but I mean, for in order to get this project in your system, you only need to git clone a project, you know, or just git clone the git repo, and just, I mean, the recommendation that we always tend to do is changing the the uh, URL where the API is, I mean, the base path, which is API in this case, and then maybe change your your, I mean, if you want to use the uh, React app that I was mentioning in the admin section, you can just change this in your system to you know, go to the uh, like non-HTTPS endpoint, just make your life easy, and, and just run Docker Compose app. This project, it provides a Docker configuration out of the box. So you just run with this command, and you have to obviously wait a little, or maybe too long. It just depends on your connection, and if you don't have all the same meshes in your system. But once that is done, and now all this happens automatically, you don't have to worry about that. I mean, you don't even need to know Docker for this. It's just run this command. I mean, there's a lot of Docker, I mean, now coming into Drupal world as well. There's a lot of tools, you know, like Lando, Ddeb, Doxel. Doxel, there's a lot of those, I mean. And those tools are great, I mean, out of the, I mean, we don't use those, we use like Docker Compose files, I mean, plain, I mean, that's, it's 
work for us. But I mean, again, in this particular case, just Docker, Compose app, and you will be all set for you. I mean, again, just grab a coffee, a beer, or something, and just be a little patient in that. And yeah, again, out of the box, this project provides with some configuration. In this particular case, um, like configuration for exposing your endpoints. So out of, I mean, again, out of the box, your project exposed data as JSON LD, JSON, or whole JSON. This is the one who, I mean, provide you with a lot of metadata that you can reuse for building, you know, the admin React tool that I was mentioning before. I mean, just pulling all this, a lot of metadata here. And also, I mean, like XML, I mean, any, all those formats or, and, uh, a, a symphony is used. I mean, uh, I mean, if you know, if you work with symphony, maybe you are used to this. Whenever you see a configuration like this, the first value on the configuration is the one that is default, right? It's not like there's no graphical interface for this. It's not like Drupal. You know, you can just drag and drop things here. So in this case, again, if you want to JSON DB first, you just leave it at the very beginning. If you want JSON to be the default value, you just you just move it a little. And the first thing that I recommend you to do is remove the default. I mean, entity that gets with the system, which is this. This entity that it's, I mean, it's as an example, they provide you with an entity. So whenever you compose your app, you can, I mean, automatically go to your, your browser and see the entity. I mean, there you can enter, I mean, you can insert data or pull data from it. And, and that's, that's it. But what if, what if you want to start working with this and adding more entities? Let's say, I mean, now I have, I mean, the project set up in my local machine. I want to start adding a new entity. Let's think about this as a, kind of like a content type where you are, will be adding fields, right? So there's this, I mean, CLI. So Symfony provides, you know, Symfony Console, which is a, a component that, I'll, I mean, I mean, allow you to, I mean, I mean, add, I mean, CLI commands on your terminal. So there's a command called make entity, which is like a generator. You know, if you are used, if you used Drupal Console before, you know, those generators help you a lot. I mean, saving you time by generating all this boilerplate code. You don't have to like do it over and over again. You don't have to worry about. I mean, adding, creating the file in the proper directory, making sure all you add all this, import all the right classes, you know, making sure, I mean, that's, you don't have to worry about that. So by running this command, something like this happens, you know, it's like, it'll start asking you a few questions, you know, what the entity name you want to provide this? I mean, what's the, um, I mean, it's also like, I mean, you want to add fields. So similar to what Drupal console do for with form generation, you can just go here and start adding fields, you know, again, remember what I told you, if you don't need the, you know, the graphical interface of Drupal for adding fields to content types, I mean, you can go here. I mean, I mean, it's like, I'm trying to map things here and there with what we know about Drupal. So just by going here and start answering questions, this, this, I mean, this generation, we will, I mean, I mean I'll do, do all that for you. And you can also go here, you know, adding like field, field name, field type, you know, string, like a text thing, and then making this is like nullable or not. <coughs> and you can just keep answering questions, adding multiple fields as you want to. And at the very, very end, it asks you if you want to make this class available for API platform. And this is, this is, this is, this is great because, again, once this process is finished, your entity will be automatically registered on the API platform project framework and then will be automatically, I mean, uh, available through the, uh, as an API, I mean, as an endpoint. Yes? Can you define what you mean by an entity in this context? Sorry? Can you define what you mean by an entity? What, what an entity is? I mean, you can map entity as a as a content type in Drupal if you want. It's like okay, so it's a it's a database table who contains fields. Okay, right. But I mean, in Drupal, an entity you will also have entities, right? And content types yeah. are not en are entity types. <laughs> but yeah, it's like just make it easier and simple, kind of like a content type. Okay. And, and again, and you can even create like related entities. Let's say I want this entity and I want this other entity like related like one to many or many to many as well from the code generation. And that's, and that's great thing, because I mean, again, you don't have to learn, I mean, uh, doctrine annotations at the very beginning. You can just run this and take a look at the code and figure out what happens and, and start, I mean, learning by, by like reverse engineering if you want to. So similar to what, I mean, we suggest to, to like when working with Drupal console, generate code, just go read the code, understand what is happening there and save you time of headaches, you know, finding out things here and there. So yeah, so you can generate this, you know, like an entity, you can, generate another thing and you know, add an A, I mean, edit fields. So for this particular case, I add like, like a post entity and a post type entity, kind of to mapping to, to Drupal. Questions? And yeah. So the end result looks something like this. You have this class in your, in your system who contains all this like namespace definition, you know, all the imports, 
importing classes you require, like use a statement. So, and this is the important part. Remember what I, what I told you about the uh, answering yes when making this, I mean, available as an API project? So it adds this annotation for you. This little thing is what makes this, this entity or this table, I mean, automatically discoverable by the system. So you can expose this as an endpoint in your, in your application. And again, the rest of things is like, like you know, doctrine, giving a tight table name. It's pretty much, I mean, with, with Drupal 8, we have these annotations, I mean, I mean, as well. So maybe this code looks kind of familiar. And remember that I add a few fields. The fields are here, you know. Like each field is, is set it here, you know. You set the column, type name, or type. It's, I mean, worry not about this. And you, we have even, we, even we have like relations, you know, like let's say I want this post and a post type. So the relation is, is here, it's like many to one. And again, I didn't have to write any of it. Just generate, answering questions, and all this generated for automatically. And well, while working with Symfony, we, I mean, let's, we tend to think, I mean, I know in Drupal, I used to do this for moving configurations, you know, like exporting configurations or, or running like hook updates for, for, I mean, updating the schema. Well, Symfony has something similar. It's called migrations. It's a component, it's called, I mean, the, the project or the package is called migrations. You use run composer require migrations and I mean, all the dependencies will be in your system, you know, like it's like composer require Drupal, you know, admin toolbar or something like that. Same way we, we require modules in Drupal, I mean, the, the, as composer packages. In this case, we require this, this, this bundle as, I mean, as a composer package. And once you have that in your system, now, uh, similar to Drupal, you can, your modules can add commands, like CLI commands, same thing for, for Symfony. So it's like, once you have this one, you have this make migration command available. So once you run this, once you run this, it will generate a class for you who contains all the schema changes, you know, like, like hook, like, like, like the hook update something for, I mean, changing your schema. And then you can just run migrations migrate to make those in sync with your database. So let's, yeah, again, run the other command, generate the entity, but it's only on the file system. It's the entity definition class file. So by running make migration, it create that sync with your database and create an, I mean, a class file for you that you can run later on with migrations migrate, and that will sync with the database. And doing something like this, having all those configurations on the file system, so make your life easy. Can you, you can just git, you know, commit, add, then push code. Someone else in your, in your team can just pull that, that repo and just run this, this migrations migrate command, and the database will be in sync. And you can also have this one in your pipeline for deploying and your building artifact server. I mean, I hope you have one like that and you don't do it manually, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just great. And what if you want to manage users? Let's say in Drupal, we have this great user, I mean, I mean system for managing, like adding or removing user. Well, uh, Symfony has this bundle, it's called user bundle. I mean, just compose a require, you know, bundle. I mean, vendor name and bundle, and you will get that for you, I mean, in the system. Then if you want to like, adding Swift mailer for, you know, whenever a user gets registered, send an email for that, you know, like kind of like Drupal, you can do that here. And it's, it takes care of doing that automatically for you, this bundle. And I mean, there is a division in the Symfony community about using this bundle. Some people say, yeah, it's great. And you know, but there's a lot of like technical debt you use that. So make sure, make sure you read the documentation here to know what you are getting into. Because I mean, it adds a lot of fields in your database. I mean, I mean we're in Drupal, we are used to do that. We're even not like tables for each one of the fields. So it's like, eh, maybe not a big deal for us. But yeah, there's a lot of fields get added. Maybe you don't need those fields, probably it's like, you know, like, Facebook, like Twitter fields. I mean, again, you can use this, learn from there, and create your own thing. And make sure you read this blog post, like do not use false user bond. I am not telling you do not, you don't use, read this, and get an opinion, your own opinion. And well, once you, once you get the system, you know, once I get the uh, running the few commands for generating the entity, the other commands to sync in the database, I have these endpoints available. Let's. Let me see if I have this in my local system. Yeah, it's coming. And now, and this is how it looks like. So this is the uh, how the project looks like. 
you know, and by doing nothing, this is what it came to, you know, like, this is telling me what the endpoint is, it's telling me which entities are registered, like pose and post type here, you know, like post type, which is the, uh, you know, like basic page or, you know, like article. And then we have the post type here. And it also tells me which fields are in the system. And, and even from here, I can, I can execute some like calls to pooling data. You know, like if I go here and execute this, you know, like get, let's say get API post, I can see here and I can just execute this and it's gonna pull anything that it's in the system. Actually, in this point, there's nothing. And it also tells me which, uh, which curl command I can use from my terminal to pull the data from, from it. It's, it's pretty cool. And again, if every single endpoint is available, you know, like if you go like post, that screen will show up. But if you go post that JSON, then you will be only, it will, they will only return the data that comes on, on those endpoints. You know, it's not, not, not this front end, you know, application that tells you more things about it. If you want to use a different format, you can use JSON LD. If you want to use this as, I mean, as an XML, just change the, uh, the format, the format I mean type. And it's smart enough to, to know which, which type of data pulling from the system. If you want to like load a particular resource, just go like, you know, like using the IDs, you know, pose and then slash one. And again, same thing. I mean, if you want to like JSON, one the JSON or JSON LD, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. If you want to use this from your terminal, I mean, maybe you are, I mean, you like to run things on terminal. I mean, I, I love to run things on terminal. And you can do this, you know, curl, get, and you know, and then you, you, you specify the, uh, the, uh, the application type, you know, the JSON or JSON LD here, you know? Remember what it was different than here, like adding the extension here, and by running this on the terminal, you specify the, the header as a header, you know, the, uh, the accept type you are requesting to, to the application. And well, if you want to add things either from your CLI or from the application, you will end up calling different endpoints, you know, like post, I mean, as a post, right? Get, it pulls data. Post, helps me to insert, like it's like an insert new data. Again, used by calling post and sending the, the payload with the fields that I want to create, it gets automatically inserted on the database. I have to do nothing. Just like, you know, calling the proper post method. I mean, doing this on JavaScript will something like, you know, this is script that post this URL to this URL and you know, which is the payload that I want to use. And if you want to update things, you can, you, you'll be end up using, you know, put, and then you same thing, calling in particular endpoint, making sure you set the ID as here, and it also send the payload. In this particular case, I am just updating one field, this, the title field. I don't want to like, update every single field. I can do this from here. So again, on your JavaScript application, you will doing things, you know, like changing things, and might, might be like, I mean, making sure, I mean, you have a process for knowing which fields are changing and then automatically, you know, doing the post thing or the put thing. And just removing, just, just delete, again, calling the endpoint, and, and that's, that's all. And whenever you want to, like, like remember what I mentioned, you, we have this, this uh, endpoint who has, like, post and then post type. So it means we have related content. So whenever you're using JSON and... Uh, if you call an endpoint, it all it pulls all of the data from the from that particular resource, like post one. But it won't be showing, let's say, if this post one it's of type page or basic page, basic page. It only will show, you know, ID of the related entity. And sometimes I want to save time. You know, I don't want to do two API calls. And you can use uh, the serialization component on uh, Symfony. And the only thing you need to do is define within your API I mean resource definition um, something that is called normalization and denormalization context groups. So by adding these groups here, you know, like says, let's create a group like read, and then by telling on the particular property I want to, let's say on the post type within my post entity, by telling, you know, whenever I read this or read and write, instead of getting and pulling the ID, Make sure you pull the whole entity for me. So I just want to call post one, and then all of the fields for post one will be set. But within the post type field, instead of telling me you know ID one or two, it will it will include all of the you know the, the entity fields for that particular I mean entity related definition. And yeah, if you don't want to do that because it's kind of it start getting kind of messy because there's a lot of fields who get related, so you can use GraphQL. So GraphQL is I mean a query language for your API. How many of you are using GraphQL already? No? You have to, that's beautiful. I mean, how many of you front end? No front end? Yeah? Your front end people is gonna love this. It's like, 
awesome. They don't even need to know what the definition of the API structure is. Like you start typing fields, and I'm automatically appear on your on, on the on the graph graphic QI QL I mean editor. Well, um, again, GraphQL offers a huge improvement for for for, for like front end people integrating, I mean calling, doing data back, I mean backend calls. Um, so whenever you are you are doing a uh, pulling data from your endpoint, you can define which fields to which uh, properties of your entity to pull that. When using JSON, you you know resource ID one, and it pulls every single field on that endpoint, right? And sometimes you don't need, I mean, all those fields. You just need like title them and body, you know, or two or three, and I mean whatever. And then you don't you don't need something like that. So GraphQL it's gonna help on that. Uh, getting GraphQL in your system, compose require, package name, and automatically you have something like this. This is um, I mean, automatically automatically available in your browser. So let me try to get this just to show you how, how this looks like. Mm -hmm. really? Did I paste it? Uh. What? What? Well, you know, demo, the demo, live demo is that thing that breaks in two seconds what you've been doing for. Try, get out of full screen and then try it. It's a crumb. screen. Yeah, that's. It's I don't know why it happened. Well, I mean, again. You can go to full screen. You can go back to the I can go back. I hate having. Uh, well, that's so again. So you don't need. I mean, again, you can just pull the particular fields you want to. You don't need to like pull anything. I mean, you can just go one by one the fields you you, you need to you require. And again, you don't need to know the uh, those fields or the the structure of your endpoint. You can start typing, and will automatically know the definition or of your endpoints, and will you know is like tell tell you which fields to you, you want to use. If you really want to know, because I mean, maybe at some point you want to know that the state structure. You can use the documentation explorer, which is right here, and you can start looking for which uh, entities you have defined in your system, and it will tell you, you know, this entity has these properties or these fields, and need this of, of type string, number, or anything, right? So you don't have to like worry about it. And well, keep moving. So, I mean, if you want to disable this GraphQL thing on production, which is, I mean, you don't want to have this available so people can query your data, right? It's like it's like having a Drupal site with admin, admin, or root, root password. We never do that, right? Uh, probably, for what I hear. Well, I mean, if you want to disable this, make, in sh make sure you have this, this I mean, uh, definition, I mean, as false. I mean, beauty of, of Symfony, this is a default API platform configuration, but if you add an extra directory here for environment, you know, like, like production or, or uh, and, you know, for, I mean, you can set environments per, I mean, variables or configuration per environment. You know, it's kind of, there's a way to do in Drupal that's kind of hacky, but I mean, you can do that as well. But again, if you want to do that only for production, make sure you change only the production file you know, for this. And, and so on development, you have it enabled and production disabled and you don't expose your, your, I mean, definition. And again, you can do something like this, you know, for pulling a particular, I mean, ID, you go like API pose and the ID number and just add any fields you want to. But, and then from the CLI, it's like this. And what if you want to pull like related data? Without turning on serialization like out of the box, you can do that. So if you don't, you don't have to do that one by one. By using GraphQL, you're saving time, I mean configuration time, you can just go here and start typing fields. And the beauty again, once you, you, you type, you, you type, type in this case, it this automatically, you know, create this like nested property for you and you can start typing the properties within that related entity. So again, without knowing your, the structure, your backend, you can create in all this, I mean, more complex or advanced ways. And same thing, if you want to use GraphQL from the DLI, something like this, or from your JavaScript application, you use a post 
and you send it the, this payload query. And what the query is, it's basically what you have here. So you can, again, you can use GraphQL, I mean, editor for testing your queries when your queries are fine. And then you can use, go and copy paste it to your, to your application, JavaScript application. And if you want to insert or update data, you can use those, something that's called mutators. It's like functions that allow you to send a payload again and insert that data or update that data for you. So it's like, it's, I mean, again, it's already built out of the box on, on the Symfony API platform. And well, how about authentication? Remember what I told you, we have users in Drupal, and again, we have this user, I mean, false user bundle, which some people say is good, some people it's not, I mean. <laughs> and whenever we are using a decouple application, then we have this, the backend application and the frontend application, and if we need to log in into the system, we need to have a way to connect those systems. So there's something called JavaScript, I mean, web token, or JWT. And it's basically away from your application to front application or CLI or any other application or implementation of your API to do calls authenticated, be authenticated system. So basically, it's go. you have this endpoint, like a plugin endpoint that you pass your credentials, user and password, make sure you encrypted those, HTTPS and all that. And it returns a token for you, like this huge amount of, you know, I mean, set of characters, I mean, you know, like letters and uh, you know, this is your valid token, it's valid for a particular time. So you can, after that, you can use that for the following request. And it lets you use that, you send that as a header on the, on the, I mean, on the next request, then you can pull data from the system. Now, you know, this guy, this user is authenticated. I mean, it's already has this valid token and that token has a time to allow, you know, like you can set for like an hour or minutes or days or forever. I mean, you don't want to do that forever, but you can. And again, composer require, la la la, and then just, you know, and if you want to refresh tokens, because when, once token expire, you need to force user to get a new token. If, whenever you get this bundle, it allows you to, you know, reuse the old token for getting a new token. So let's say if uh, the user was authenticated before, and then he knows that token was valid at some point, and then allow you to refresh the token to avoid forcing the user to log in like, like way too much. It's uh, kind of like having a, like, like, I mean, like, never expired token, but it helps sometimes. Use carefully, or better don't use that. <laughs> okay, whenever working with JW, I mean, with tokens, you can do, I mean, there's, I mean, Symfony is built on events, you know, like Drupal has these hooks, Nimer, it's changing to events. I mean, unfortunately, not all of the hooks are, are migrated, but yeah, you have events. But using, by using those events, you can you know, tell, tell your token, you know, whenever you create a new token for these, for users, make, you can add any data that you want, you know, like organization or, or user group or things that you can then reuse on your, on your React application, right? So you can pass data from within the token that gets encrypted and all that, you know, like none, no way to like read that, that you can reuse on your system. Yeah, you can pass this token, la la la. Same thing, you know, whenever you, this is where, when the, using gets, the user gets loaded and the token gets created, you register like new, <laughs> new key values, right, that you can reuse. And how to use those? By using the success event, so whenever the token gets, you know, the user gets authenticated and I get the token on my front end, I can just use the, uh, I mean, use like this, you know, get the data user and then pull it. Again, so it's store and get. Well, how about front end? Let's talk about front end on the latest part of this session. And for this, I mean, whenever we are building this kind of application, this is like web app thing, we end up, I mean, I mean, uh, loving this recipe, you know, Re React, Redux, Saga, and Undesign. This is for the component part. And how many of you are in video games, you know, you know, like Overwatch? So, so this project is called DVA, which is, isn't awesome, you know, it's like there's, you know, mixing, you know, in, you know, development and, and games and all that. And this project is a, uh, like, React Redux framework. And it basically allows you to have, you know, out of the box, Redux and when React, Redux, which allows you to manage the state of your application. So if you don't know front end, ask your front end. And uh, you know what's Redux? You know, it's like it's like having a time machine for your state on 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 React. You know, you can travel to any point during the lifetime cycle of your application to figure out you know what's what's happening, what's I mean, what's changed on the state, and allow you to you know do a better management of the state as well. 
And then it's Redux Saga, which is something on top of Redux that allows you to do like API calls, you know, whenever you are using a, an API, you know, like, like API platform or JSON API from Drupal, allows you to easily interact with those APIs without messing a lot of code. You know, it's like Redux is kind of verbose when, you know, like, like interacting with the state. Well, Saga helps you a lot on that as well. And then you, we use Ant Design, which is a, a lot of like React components out of the box, you know, for that. And, you know, like every single component that you can imagine is here, you know, cards, I mean, grids, I mean, I mean, I know, sliders, I mean, layout for like sidebars. I mean, anything that you can imagine is just right here. I mean, and uh, just, I mean, whenever you are using this recipe, I mean, some of the tips that, that I that I had, something that some things we have and like let me discover. And uh, this project use Rothog. I mean, again, going back to Overwatch, another, I mean, another, I mean, uh, I mean, character of the game. Well, they have this. They use this for like configuration. And, you know, we get rid of that. We use Webpack. I mean, we already know Webpack. We've been doing React for a while, so, so it took us like probably like a day getting rid of that and use Webpack. So invest that day. I mean, it will save you a lot of headaches later on. And then we use Apollo Fetch for doing the GraphQL calls from the React app. Apollo Fetch is a library that allows you to do GraphQL calls in either pooling or using mutators for, for I mean, updating data back in the system. And we use JW decode component for extracting data from that, you know, the GW token that gets pulled from, from the system and allows me to get data in any, you know, remember the key values that I mentioned, you can add like groups, user group or roles or things like that. You can use JW decode for extracting that, that token and you work with the data that it came from. And again, for basic stuff you want to store in the system, use local storage. For more advanced thing and data that you want to have like more complex or you want to encrypt and you don't want that like, you know, someone who is savvy enough clicking things in the browser and going to local storage data, use index, indexed DB for it so you can encrypt data and you can have like more complex structure what you're pulling from from the API. And again, whenever again, whenever we are working in a headless decouple, I mean, project, we have the back end in one side and the front end in the other side, and somehow we need to communicate. We tend to use socket IO and Redis for this. You know, we have this Redis, I mean, where we register messages on the back end. You know, let's say, I mean, Symfony has the, all this event system, right? So whenever I do something on the back end, like this endpoint enters a particular data on the back end, Calling this and this, I mean this JSON API or GraphQL. There, I I can trigger an event. Then that event can use Redis for for I mean for like um, emitting a message. And then on my front end, I can use again socket IO for pulling uh, on, like listening to that particular channel and pull that data and do whatever I want to do. There's there's a new project from the guy who who create uh, API platform. I don't recall the name. I, mean, I I can get the link. I mean once we finish or ping me during the event and I'll get you that. And that looks beautiful. It will fix this issue. And there's a Go application, and it's like allows you to like fetch data and pull data from the back end, from the from the front end to the back end. And but what if you what if you if we want to go like fully headless approach? I mean, in this case, what I'm what I was showing you, you know, having this React application pulling the you know the endpoint, the endpoint is always live, you know, because it's pulling directly from it. What if we want to go the headless approach? I mean. I've been preaching a lot of like Gatsby lately. I don't know if you, I mean, if you follow me on Twitter, maybe I mean, you hate Gatsby at this point because I keep talking about Gatsby every single day because I love it. It's just great. So if you want to use this project with Gatsby, and you can do that. Let's say keep using you know, Symfony and IP, API platform and use Gatsby. And Gatsby, it's a, uh, something like Blazing Fast Site Generator for React. It is a tool. It's a React application that allows you to pull data from different sources. I mean. Things like different like endpoints, like let's say we have this API platform who exposed end, I mean, these endpoints, and I can use Gatsby for pulling data. Maybe someone else wrote this, I mean, GraphQL, I mean, I mean uh, endpoint that I can, I mean, read data. Maybe I can read files, like markdown files from the file system. Like in our case, we tend to build, I mean, more complex application. We have this website who is pulling data from Drupal and then for, for this MongoDB application and like Meteor application is using Mongo and there's, in Mongo world, there's no way to expose an API, so you can use GraphQL for do that. So yet, having, using Gatsby, you can pull data from different sources and then just build, you know, a React site 
right? You can build this React site. It's not a, I mean, it's not a static. It's, it's flat files, right? Because some people tend to talk about Gatsby Boss as static. No, nah, it's not a static because in, in the end, it's a React application. So you can have logic in this React for keep, re I mean, keep pulling data from different APIs, I mean, again, and just keep changing dynamically data on the system. But again, you can, same approach, have your endpoint, having Gatsby in the middle for pulling that as a build system and then generate this React application for, for that. And well, whenever you are using Gatsby, make sure you use the, you know, the source, GraphQL, you know, all this plugin, you know, transformer remark to make sure you have markdown to like properly convert it into, into that. If you have images on that and those markdown files get automatically like, you know, get optimized. There are some few plugins similar to Drupal, similar to, you know, Drupal we have modules and Symfony we have bundles. So well, Gatsby has plugins. And finally, I mean, choose the right tool for the job. I mean, if it's fine to use Drupal, let's use Drupal, but please don't abuse Drupal. I mean, we've been doing that forever. I mean, we have been doing Drupal for like 10 years, and there's some, most of it, I mean, some of the times they're like, no, this shouldn't be a Drupal, but let's go and use Drupal because we already know that. So, I mean, again, three years ago when I joined the company, we decided to kind of try another approach whenever it's not Drupal the best choice, right? So again, if there is no content, heavy content-centric project, in, but you still need an API, maybe this approach makes sense. I mean, if you don't require to have your site, you know, like pulling live data from an API, maybe Gatsby is the way to go because Gatsby is beautiful. And right, again, just the right tool for the job. And I mean, any questions? Again, feel free to ping me during the event or right now. Did I? Questions? Yes? No? It was interesting? Complicated? Yes? Uh, well, I, I've done once uh, a Symfony also API project with React on the front end. Uh, I didn't use the API platform, though I heard of it. I used Symfony uh, REST bundle. Okay. I have friends of Symfony. How do you normally, well, I solve it my way, but how do you normally, there are some properties on the entities and you don't want to expose them on the API. For example, hashed passwords from the users, or depending on the role of the user, like sometimes you get access to this field, sometimes you can only read it, sometimes you can also write it, and some others they don't have any access. Remember the, serial, the serializer thing that I showed? Yeah, there's through annotations, you can define which, based on the user, on, on the group, on the role that the user has assigned to, Define, decided to show or hide those particular fields. So it's simple as adding an annotation. And since we're reusing annotations on Drupal, just translate that knowledge to Symfony and everyone's happy. Yep. But yeah, that's, that's a way yeah. to do. And, and same thing for GraphQL, sorry about that. There's another serialization group for GraphQL that you can use. So make sure you use the proper one, if you, either you're using the JSON API endpoints or GraphQL endpoints. And then if you don't expose those I mean, attributes, then GraphQL doesn't register on their own like you know, like like typing system so you don't find it. Yes? Oh yeah, so other, sorry. Yeah, the other community that's doing uh uh this endless stuff and in in the Laravel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you can you is your name can you give us any yeah. like context of like <laughs> yeah. you know Laravel Laravel trying to do the kind of stuff you're talking about here compared to doing it through Laravel has a lot of magic, I mean out of the box, which is great for building like like prototypes and things like that. So Laravel has uh, like functions within your entities, you know, like to, to, to JSON array or something, and just automatically, actually in Laravel, every, I mean, every uh, entity, it's like JSON, JSON in, I mean, available, like out of the box, just by using on the return, you know, on the return, I mean, request type of, you can say, you know, to array or to JSON something. I don't recall the proper, exact, exact function name, but your method name, you can use that and you can just turn those automatically. And I I saw the other day someone tweeting about something similar to this on the Laravel world. But there, there's a project like just like this with the same I mean functionality, like exposing, like more advanced like this. I mean, because what I've been telling you about, you can do that, but it's like a lot of code involved. You need to like create your own controllers and adding this return method, calling the proper, you know, two string thing. So a, lot of what, a lot of what the services that are provided in console is worth a lot of value. Again? Uh, is it the uh, kind of services that are bundled in console you're referring to that bundle this up so you don't have to write a lot of code? Before? Yeah, I mean, it's again, I mean, since it's already, I mean, this is a, a like framework with that purpose, you know, for exposing that. And with Laravel, you can either build it or you can use it. I mean, there is a project for, for that as well on Laravel. It's, it's, it's very new, 
but there's something just like API platform. I saw the other day, I mean, a few days ago or weeks ago. So yeah, there, there it is, I mean, ways to do that. And, I mean, again, another benefit of using something like this is bootstrapping Symfony is way faster and cheap, I mean, than, than bootstrapping a Drupal site because Drupal has a lot of pieces. I mean, whenever you need Drupal, go ahead and use Drupal. There's nothing wrong with Drupal. I love Drupal. I've been using Drupal for years and contributing to Drupal and all that. But I mean, uh, sometimes it's not the best choice. I mean, keep stop abusing Drupal and keep stop abusing paragraphs as well. So thank you.